There's a group of people that have met monthly to pray. We meet electronically because we're not in the same physical location. But we've met monthly to pray uh, for the going forward of the work of God in Europe. If I remember right, we've met for several years now monthly to pray. And of course, we miss some months, but we purpose before God to meet monthly. And um, yeah, I'm excited for what the living God is going to do in a coming day on, on your continent. And I'm excited for what the living God is going to do in a coming day on, on our continent as well. Praise God that we have such an amazing God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. And then skip, if you would, down to verse number 18. After a person has put on their armor, verse 18 says this, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray one more time. Lord, it's such a delight this morning corporately just to quiet our hearts in the presence of a God like you. We want to start out our time together and just say that we love you. It's such a delight to have a a God that is perfect in every way. You're mighty. Lord, we read in this passage that we're in a spiritual battle. How well would we do in in any kind of a battle without a God like you? We're so thankful for the mightiness of our God this morning. Lord, you're tender. Your word, it it says that you're a wonderful counselor. We find that to be true as we walk with you. Your word, it says that you are near to the brokenhearted. We find that to be true as we walk with you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Lord, at the worst times of our life, when we're torn apart inside, if we'll let you, we find you to be the most beautiful that we've ever found you to be at those times. You're an amazing God. How how could we possibly overstate it? It is, it's wonderful to have a God like you. How could we possibly praise you enough? How could we possibly love you enough? Lord, we just want to lay, lay the day at your feet once again. I, I so say amen to what my brother already prayed. I'm just burdened, and I just want to pray that you would, would um, win the victory all throughout this day. We read about a spiritual battle. Lord, we would be fools. We would be so foolish not to realize there's a spiritual battle here today, and, and only our God can win it. And so we do lay our day at your feet. We lay each one of us at your feet. We want your best in every life that's in this room. Lord, I have a wife that I adore back home. I want your best in her life. I have two kids that I adore back home. They're radically different from each other. I want your best in both of their lives. Lord, the people in this room, my love for my family back home is just a, it's the smallest, tiniest little reflection of your love for the people in this room. What a delight that is, Lord. We don't have to try to come in prayer and twist your arm to be willing to work today. You've come with armfuls of blessing. We, we pray that you'd help us to get out of the way. Me first and foremost, because I'm the one who's standing up here talking. Lord, please don't let me get in the way today of what you want to accomplish. But then for every one of us, Lord, we pray that, that we would get out of the way and allow you to have the work that a, a perfect, loving, powerful, heavenly father wants to accomplish in our midst today lord it's so much bigger than that too if we'll let you have your work in our lives today i can only imagine literally i can only imagine the impact 
that could have on Scotland, that it could have on the British Isles as a whole, that it, that it could have on the world. So we lay our day at your feet. We pray that thy will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. What a joy to be able to anticipate the victories of God today, knowing your character. In the name of Jesus Christ the righteous, we ask this. Amen. So if you want to jot down a title, um, you could just jot down praying in the Spirit. We read that little phrase. Um, there's, two, there's two places in God's New Testament that, that that phrase occurs. Here in Ephesians 6 and in the book of Jude. And Lord willing, in my times, we'll, we'll look at this. Um, we'll look at these two phrases today. And, and I don't want to just pull them out of their context, of course. That's where error comes from, right? When you just pull phrases out of the Word of God, that's called pretexting. And, and you, you make it say what you want it to say. So what we're going to do is look at what did Paul mean when the Spirit of God inspired him to pen this phrase, praying in the Spirit. And then, Lord willing, this afternoon, we'll look at what did Jude, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, what did he mean when, when he penned that phrase, praying always with all prayer and supplication in, in the Spirit. So, so jumping right in, I have three points that I want to observe from this text this morning. Point number one, you are in a battle. You are in a battle. And let's read it again, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, and then we could ask the text why, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's the schemes of the devil. We have a very intelligent adversary um, who knows the Word of God better than we do, and he's out for the destruction of the people of God. He's out to rob glory from the Lord Jesus Christ in any conceivable way that he, that he can. And so this intelligent being created by God, evil, right? He's smart and he's scheming against the people of God. And so the Apostle Paul tells the Ephesian Christians, you need to be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Again, if you look into these words, it's, it's really beautiful. Be strong in the Greek would be to be continually strengthened. It's not inherent strength. And, and this is sad that I remember this, but I remember how much I could bench press in high school, right? I was a football player, American football. And so I remember, I remember what, who could bench more than me. <laughs> I remember who could not bench as much as me. I remember my squat, right? In, in, in what I could squat in high school. And I know that's sad, <laughs> but, but it was so typical of, of that stage of my life, right? And what I valued and what I was striving for. Um, this is not referring to inherent strength. It's not just telling you, go home and try harder, right? It's not saying, it's not saying be a strong Christian. It's saying, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. So to be continually strengthened or continually filled up with his strength. It's very similar to the concept of the filling of the Holy Spirit, right? In the same book, it says, be not drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be ye filled with the Spirit. And it means constantly filled. We have to be constantly being filled in order to be filled. Um, the, the man that was greatly used of God years ago, Dwight Moody, they asked him, they said, why do you always talk about being filled? Why do you keep on about this subject being filled? And his response, he smiled and he said, because I leak. Right? And so we find, a very, we find a very similar theological concept here that he's saying be continually strengthened in the Lord in the power of his might. And that's power as an endowment, right? Not, in, not inerrant power, not inherited power right power it's it's power as given by god so power the power of god the best biblical illustration that i can think of is samson and so so he he was powerful right but he was powerful because of the power of god in him one of the saddest phrases in all the word of god to me is when it says that he wist not that the lord had departed from him do you remember that little phrase man that to me is brutal he knew not that the lord had departed from him. This, this instrument in the hand of God, it's a remarkable story, really. He goes from such power to such weakness. Um, and, he, and there was a period there where he was weak, but he didn't know he was weak. Man, I find that, 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 I find that so incredibly 
incredibly sad. And then at the end of the story, of course, he's, he's had his eyes put out. He's, he's a slave. There's so many illustrations. Um, so many of the Christians these days, um, they don't see the way Christ sees. Um, and so many of the Christians today, they're bound by religion. They're bound by dead orthodoxy. They're bound by um, moral failure. They're, you know, they're bound in so many ways and they just need to be they need to be strengthened with might um, that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. The, the prayer of Ephesians 3. Anyways, he says, O oh Lord, right? Judges 16. He says, O oh Lord, strengthen me. And then, and then the Lord does strengthen him. Power as an endowment, not his power. Right? The power of God manifested through an instrument. And the Lord does strengthen him and he pushes those pillars. And of course, he wins that great... He wins that great victory at the end of his life. There's so many parallels. The Apostle Paul, in this book, in Ephesians 3, he says, strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That's power as an endowment. Strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. For what purpose? That Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Is the Apostle Paul, here's, here's a theological question, is the Apostle Paul praying that the Ephesian Christians would get saved? I won't be offended if you answer. No, he's praying for intimacy, isn't he? He, he's, he prays that something would happen inside of the Christians. He says, for this reason I bow my knees to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In, in what he's bowing his knees, what is serious enough that would make the the aged apostle get down on his knees and, and labor for the people of God in prayer is that there was a lack of intimacy between the people of God and their God. And the solution to that was that there needed to be a power from the Holy Spirit, he says in Ephesians chapter 3, in order to produce intimacy that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. When I went home from Ireland last um, fall, I was here for three weeks when I went home to, to my wife, um, I said over FaceTime to her toward the end of that trip, I said, I really like living with you. <laughs> and, and I missed my wife. I didn't go home and go in, set my bags down inside the door, go straight down into my office and study marriage. I had no desire to do that. I just wanted to go home and be where my wife was again, be where my kids were again. Intimacy, right? Oh, I enjoy God's gift to me. My, my help me, I enjoy her so much. The, the Apostle Paul here, he says, there's a lack of intimacy between God and his people. And so the solution to that is prayer in Paul's mind. And then the result of prayer will be there will be a power inside of the people of God that is a result of the Spirit of God specifically doing a work. And that work will be to the end that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith. It's not salvation. No theologian worth his salt will read that passage and say that that's salvation. It's intimacy between Christ and his people. In fact, he says it in a different way. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It's intimacy. It's all intimacy. And so it's, it's an endowment of power from an outside source. And so here he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The strategizing of the devil. So, so point number one is so simple. You are in a battle. Does anybody know the name Faraday? If you're not familiar with these videos, I would so highly recommend them to you. There, there are, I forget how many, if it's five or if it's four or six. Um, Keith Kaiser uh, interviewed Peter Brandon and um, asked him, he, he had a series of four or five of these videos. They're on Voices for Christ, if you're interested in looking them up. And Peter Brandon, in one of these videos, he talks about a period of time about a hundred years ago on this continent where the power of God was so evident amongst the people of God. Um, they were breaking bread week by week. And he tells about a time when um, in the breaking of bread. Now, we would all say that that's not the purpose of the breaking of bread, the primary purpose. But in the breaking of bread, the power of God was so tangible that um, people were being saved after the breaking of bread almost every week. 
they were beholding the glory of the Lord. Really, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it describes this, the proper functioning of the New Testament church. And when the New Testament church functions the way that it should, it will cause an unbeliever or an uninformed person to come in and to fall on their face before God. And they leave bearing the testimony that God was truly in that place. Well, well, Faraday, he told Brandon, and so Brandon is, is telling it on these videos, but he was describing a time when the power of God was moving incredibly amongst the people of God. Now, I'm not familiar with the details, and probably the details don't matter. But he talks about the leaders at that time pleading with the people of God not to do a particular thing. Now, I don't know and I don't care what that particular thing was. But the leader's sense at that time was that this would grieve and quench the Spirit of God. And so they pleaded with the people not to do something. And the people decided to go ahead and venture into it. And, and he said, just like that, the power of God just left. just whoo, And it was just gone. No more people being saved week after week after week. You know, that was over 100 years ago. Now, I say this with tremendous fear and trepidation. So much of what we are today is a leftover of a great work of God that took place in the past. I don't like that. I don't like to say that. But that is absolutely true. I don't want to live my life wandering around in the desert waiting to die. Spiritually. Man, I don't want that. I want to know him <laughs> and the power of his resurrection. And you look into those Greek words. It's to know by experience, right? I want to experience Christ, the Apostle Paul says. I want to experience the power of the resurrection. That is the ultimate pinnacle of God's power in the scriptures. He doesn't just say, I want to see somebody saved every week. Most of us would be blown away by that, wouldn't we? He doesn't say that. I want to see power enough that someone would get saved every week. He says, I want to experience the power of the resurrection, fellowship of sufferings, being conformed even to the point of the death of Christ on the cross. Is that the cry of your heart? Man, I hope, I hope so. We, we are in a battle, says, says the Apostle Paul. Um, the North American Week of Prayer Last year, the theme that God led the committee to was the tearing down of strongholds. And so we prayed about that all week long. Um, if you want, you're welcome to benefit from it. I don't think the prayer times are recorded anymore on the website, but the opening thoughts are still recorded on the website. Anyways, we prayed all week long about the tearing down of strongholds. And, and that's his application here, that you're in a battle. So because you're in a battle, we need to put on the armor. And then the first thing we do once we put on the armor is pray. Well, last year, we, we did this all week long, right? Monday to Friday, we, we, we prayed about the tearing down of strongholds. And I've never seen so many answers to prayer in all of my life. I really should have recorded it. I didn't record one. Um, but, but after that week, this flood of reports of answered prayer just kept coming from, from every corner of the continent of North America. Individuals with strongholds torn down in their lives. Marriages that had been on the verge of divorce for a decade where husband and wife repent and, and begin the process of restoration and healing in that relationship. Local assemblies, right? Local churches where the, the power of God had not been evident for so long. Seeing little glimpses of the power of God bursting out. And all all through, all through May, all through June, I kept passing these reports on. They would come in on Facebook Messenger. They would come in on text. They'd come in on email. And I kept passing them on to people just for the encouragement of God's people. And, and I just could not believe the flood of answered prayer. You know, you would think as a 43-year-old that has walked with God since I was five, and I know that's quite young, but I've been saved since I was five. You think I would know at this point that God answers prayer. And yet, and yet still, when you pray and God answers, it's like, wow, look at that. Right? Prayer works. And it's so encouraging. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying right here, that you are in a battle. Um, so let me just put it incredibly simply. The two places on planet Earth, I've had the privilege of being on four continents, right? So there's two continents that I haven't stood on. Um, but on four continents that I've been on, 
There are two places on planet Earth that I experience more spiritual warfare than any other place on planet Earth. And this shocks me. You know where those are? I've been around the heart of Africa. I've been around South America. I've been around Europe. And I've been around North America. The two places that I experience vivid spiritual warfare more than any other place in the world, Spanish Wells in the Bahamas and Northern Ireland. You know why I think that is? This is my sense of it. Religiosity. Religious flesh. Dead orthodoxy. There's an incredible battle in these lands. Now, is there a battle in China? Sure there is. Sure there's a battle in China. I have a friend that goes in and out of China. Right? He doesn't actually so much now, but he did for years and years. Um, he had a translator. I don't think I'll say the name of the translator out loud. This man has suffered for Christ. He's been in prison for Christ. He's been beaten for Christ. He's been starved for Christ. Anyways, he's my friend's translator. Um, he was praying one night. Um, his, his brother-in-law was laying next to him, and um, he was praying and praying and praying. His brother-in-law was possessed by a demon. And so he's laboring in prayer, laboring in prayer. He, in the wee hours of the morning, he was exhausted. And so he laid down and he looked up in the trees. This is his story, not mine. Uh, he looked up in the trees and he saw circles of light in the trees. And he knew, he knew that he should get up and that he should pray more. But he was so tired, right? And he thought, I'm just going to close my eyes just for a moment. And so he, he laid his head down. He closed his eyes, almost instantaneously fell asleep. And his brother-in-law leapt upon him possessed by a demon, leapt upon him, beat him almost to death. And then the brother-in-law went and cast himself down a well and died. On the same exact day of the year that his demon-possessed father had done that years before. That's a spiritual battle, right? Now, I don't see those kinds of battles. And, and because we don't see those kinds of battles, I, I do see battles, by the way, but because we don't see